This textbook says mutations are the original source of variation in populations, by the, shown by the many varieties of roses available. I agree, probably all the roses are mutants from the original rose. I agree with that. That's not evolution, that's a variety of rose. Mutations do not produce any kind of evolution, and anybody that studies biology knows that. Pierre Gross believes in evolution, but he says it doesn't work, folks, it doesn't happen. Here's a five-legged bull, that is a mutation. Notice he did not get any new information. Getting an extra leg is not new information, it's a scrambling of existing information. Doesn't the bull already have legs? So it just made one in the wrong place, that's all. Here's a short-legged sheep, that's a mutant. No new information is added, though. That's a loss of information. And he's the first one the wolf is going to catch. Go, <laughs> oh, boys, go. Here comes the wolf. <laughs> oh, Herman didn't make it. There's a two-headed turtle. That's a mutant. It's not ninja, but he's mutant. Okay. <laughs> he's going to freeze first winter because nobody makes a double-neck turtleneck sweater. <laughs> I've never seen one. See, a mutation is scrambling existing information. It's not new information. If you can scramble up the letters to the word Christmas, you can get all sorts of different words. But you're never going to get Xerox, Zebra, or Queen out of Christmas. The letters aren't available. And scrambling existing gene code will not give you new information. This textbook shows the kids a four-wing fly. Look what it says here now. Normal fruit flies have two wings. This mutant has four. This rare mutation, like most mutations, is harmful. Watch this carefully. It says beneficial mutations are the raw material for natural selection. Uh, excuse me, teacher. Why don't they give an example of a beneficial mutation? Why did they show us a bad one and tell us about the good ones? You see, beneficial mutations are pure imagination. They don't exist in reality. You have to imagine that they happen. Oh, wow, there must have been a bunch of them, too. Oh. Nobody ever shows one. One professor said, I know a beneficial mutation. I said, what is that, sir? He said, people in Africa that get sickle cell anemia are less likely to get malaria. I said, sir, that is brilliant, you know. That's like saying if you cut off your legs, you can't get athlete's foot. <laughs> and by the way, that's the one they always bring out because that's the only one they've got. Guarantee, you get into discussion on evolution, ask somebody for a beneficial mutation, I guarantee they'll bring that one up right there. That's all they've got. And that's not beneficial. Neither sickle cell nor malaria is beneficial. They say, evolution and natural selection go together. Oh, yeah. This one says, natural selection causes evolution. No, it does not. Natural selection selects. If I said, I'm going to select everybody in the room over 12 feet tall to survive, everybody else dies. I don't have anybody to select from, do I? No. Natural selection doesn't create. If I wanted to create a race of people over 12 feet tall, so I kept killing everybody under 12 feet tall, how long would it take to get a race of people 12 feet tall? <laughs> it's never going to do it. Hello. Now, the average population today probably ranges from, say, 5 feet to 6 foot 6 or something. I probably could create a population of people that are all 6 foot 6 or maybe even 7 foot, you know, by continually killing everybody under a certain point. Sure, you could do that. But you're selecting part of the gene code that already exists. You're not creating anything new. Natural selection is a conservative process. The creation is thought of it first. And it's it doesn't, it selects, it doesn't create. This guy says, natural selection may have a stabilizing effect, but it does not promote speciation. It is not a creative force. Don't let them tell you it is. Natural selection is selection, not creation. Why they don't see this, I don't know. This textbook says, finches with larger beaks, larger and stronger beaks, were better able to open the tough pods, and so they survived. Evolution by natural selection had occurred in just one year. That is pure propaganda. It's still a bird, and it reverted right back to the same national average after the famine or the dry spell went by. Part of the population already had the genes for tougher beaks. Natural selection does not lead to evolution. This is a lie. Natural selection selects. I'll show you. If you worked in a factory that made cars, and your job was quality control, every car that goes by, your job is to, you know, make, see if it runs. Slam the door, kick the tires, whatever you do to check it. You know, see if it works. If you caught every single mistake, they don't, by the way, <laughs> but if you did, 
How long would it take that process to change the car to an airplane? You say, Brother Hovind, you don't understand. Quality control doesn't change it. Uh, oh, I do understand. Natural selection is like quality control. It doesn't create a thing. It makes sure you have a good species, but it won't change it to something else. They tell the kids in school, the peppered moth is evidence for evolution. Yes, boys and girls, they counted the moths on the trees. Must have been a government project. <laughs> and said it was 95% light color and 5% black. Then they tell the kids that the trees turn black from coal-burning factories, and it was only 5% light and 95% black around the factories. The problem is the whole story is a lie. Didn't happen. After 40 years of watching, they found two moths on the trees. Two in 40 years. So they glued dead moths to the tree to take that picture for your kid's textbook. Those are dead moths glued on a tree trunk. It's a lie. The story's a phony. But they still teach it. That's all they've got. I think that page ought to be torn out of the book. They tell the kids in the Tulsa Zoo, yes, this is proof for evolution right here. Proven wrong years ago. There's a good website, Icons of Evolution, or the, web, or the book Icons of Evolution has a whole lot on it. Peppered moth. See, they talk about survival of the fittest. Well, survival of the fittest does not explain arrival of the fittest. And survival of the fittest, I think, is what's called a tautology, a sentence that means nothing. If you say, Professor, why did it survive? Say, oh, because it's the fittest, you know, survival of the fittest. Well, how do you know it's the fittest? Because it survived. How else can you tell? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Look, folks, if a whale goes through a school of fish and eats 80% of them, it's not survival of the fittest. It's called survival of the luckiest. <laughs> That's what really happens out there. But some of these people make these good observations and still come to the wrong conclusions. I don't know if you heard the story, but there was a bunch of scientists one day that wanted to see how far a frog could jump. They put the big old frog down there and said, jump frog, jump. That frog, shh, boing, he jumped 80 inches. Wow, he brought him back, cut off one leg. Said, jump frog, jump. He only went 70. They brought him back, cut off another leg. Said, jump, frog. He went 60. They brought him back, cut off another leg. Said, jump, frog. He went 50. They brought the frog back, cut off his last leg. Said, jump, frog. You know, they expected he might go maybe 40 based on the data so far. <laughs> Actual jump was zero. The frog didn't move. They yelled louder, jump, frog. The frog didn't move. They were baffled. They tried the experiment again. Uh, new frog. <laughs> got the same results every time. So the brilliant scientists got their data together and said, folks, you know what? We can conclude that the frog jumped less as the legs were removed. <laughs> hey, you have to give them credit, folks. That is a good observation. Then they said, but we must conclude that a frog with no legs goes deaf. You had a good observation there, fella, but you blew it with your conclusion. <laughs> That's what they did with the fruit flies, though. They put them flies in the laboratory, and they nuked them and microwaved them and x-rayed them and did all sorts of mean things to those flies, and they got all kinds of mutated flies. They got flies with curled wings. They fly around, bzz, 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 couldn't go anywhere. They got flies with no wings. What do you call that? A crawl? Can't fly. They raised all these mutated flies in the laboratory and said, folks, you know what? All the mutations observed produced flies that were inferior to Grandpa Fly. Hey, that's a good observation. They said, so we must conclude that flies have evolved as far as they can go. <laughs> jump, frog, jump. <laughs> you got a good observation there, but you know, maybe you could conclude that God made them right to begin with, and all you're doing is messing them up in your laboratory. Hmm. Yeah. This guy says, flies in the north have wings 4% larger than flies in the south. And that proves evolution? Who is dumb enough to care? <laughs> then they tell the kids to think critically. Yes, boys and girls, do you think humans are still evolving? What kind of question is that? That's one of those questions like, have you stopped beating your wife yet? <laughs> wow, now let me think. If I say yes, I'm admitting I did. If I say no, I'm still doing it. Hey, did you know it is possible for a question to already have a built-in assumption? 
Doesn't their question assume that evolution happened? I would say, teacher, this question is poorly written. It assumes evolution has happened when it has not. It's like asking the question, you know, why are elephants orange? You know, that's a good question. Why are they orange anyway? I don't know. <laughs> They're not. Hello. <laughs> and this question is not designed to make the students think critically. Do you think humans are still evolving? That's a Soviet-style indoctrination type question. And when the kid gets done with his course, he's going to think he knows how to think critically. And he doesn't know how to think at all. He knows how to be told what to believe. That's not education. That's indoctrination, Soviet style. They tell the kids, we've got evidence from structure. This is called the homology argument. Yes, boys and girls, did you know you've got two bones in your wrist, radius and ulna? Mm -hmm. And did you know the whale has two bones in his flipper? And look at this. They're called radius and ulna. Right there. See? That proves we're related. <laughs> That's what they tell them. Look at this. These homologous structures provide evidence that these animals evolved from a common ancestor. Think critically. A seal's flipper and human arm have different functions. What evidence might help show that both structures evolved from a forelimb of a common ancestor? They show the kids the similar structures. This is in every biology book I've seen. This is one of the evidences for evolution. They call it comparative anatomy. It says comparative anatomy provides further evidence of evolution. The commonality suggests that these and other vertebrate animals are all related. They probably evolved from a common ancestor. This is a lie. They probably have a common designer. You know, maybe the same guy designed them all. But every textbook around the world, I've got books from Latvia and Mexico and Russia, they're all teaching the same thing, folks. And it's silly. By the way, those bones develop from different genes on the chromosomes of these different animals. They're not homologous. Similar design might prove the same designer made them. Did you know the lug nuts from a Pontiac will fit on a Chevy? You can go outside and try it. It'll work. <laughs> that proves they both evolved from a Honda 14 million years ago. <laughs> now look, it's a fact. It's a good observation when they say many animals have a similar forelimb structure. That is a good observation. I agree. Then they say, they must have had a common ancestor. Oh, I disagree. This helps prove we all came from a rock. Oh, jump, frog, jump. 